Hello everyone and welcome to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. We're glad you're tuned in. We want to give a shout out to our friends at Southern Oregon PBS, KTVL, KDRV, and the Dove Network. Thank you for hosting us on your station. In the Medford School District, we have one shared vision and that we believe that all are learning and learning is for all. And what better place to do that than right here on Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Hi, my name is Ivan Olinghouse and I am an electives teacher here at Hedrick Middle School. And today we're going to show you a little bit about programming your own video games using a platform called Scratch. Scratch is part of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. If you're ever interested in going to a really good college for technology, that would be uh, on the top of my list. Uh, Scratch is a wonderful program. It doesn't require you to be able to type super fast or anything like that. You're not typing out the coding. You're actually snapping coding together using Lego block like coding. So today um, I'm going to show you how to get into it and we're going to program a game uh, inside of it today. We'll see if we can do the whole thing here in a half hour. Uh, the game today I'm going to show you is the original Atari game uh, Pong. We're going to do a variation on that. It's like a ping pong game. We're going to play with the paddles here. All right, so let's get into it. Um, this particular project um, you're going to want to have a little Google uh, screen for um, and all you need to do is type in Scratch. Now something I should mention is that Scratch is designed for anybody who's in third grade through twelfth grade. You'll see right here it is the very first option on uh, the web search. Scratch.mit.edu is technically the uh, URL address. We'll click on Scratch here. Now Scratch is a community based um, program so parents it's always good to monitor anytime your kids go online. Um, go ahead and monitor what it is that they're doing online. Scratch is no different. There is a lot of wonderful stuff out here in Scratch though and it is a heavily moderated uh, site. That means lots of adults are going through and scrubbing it, checking it to make sure the content's appropriate. But you, you can always run into something if you happen to be the first person to come across something. So what you should know about it is that there are literally hundreds of thousands of projects that have been uploaded onto this site. Um, and you can search for them and uh, there's lots of games on here. You can modify games. You can play with other people's stuff. To scratch literally means encoding to scratch off of somebody else's project. It allows you to, um, you're basically um, legally stealing some of their code um, in order to build something for yours. Um, so first off though, I should mention we should have a sign in up here. You can uh, join Scratch as well. If you join Scratch, you can join it with a school email address. However, you won't be able to recover your password if you join with a school email address because most school email addresses have a firewall that allow, um, that do not allow outside um, people to email your student. So um, hey, if you're a kid uh, out there and you've got an email address like a school one, you can use it. Um, however, um, and that allows you to like save your projects. Um, however, you can't publish stuff and also you can't recover your password. If you have a general email, uh, a personal email, you can create an account using that and then you'll be able to publish your own content. Um, you'll be able to email the folks at Scratch um, if you lose your password, things like that. Uh, however, you don't have to have an account to do this, anything on here. You can actually create uh, right here. Um, we're just going to click that create button. And voila, this is our workspace right here. So in the workspace, this big white area in the middle, this is where we're going to do most of our coding. We have a little preview window up here. And down below here, it's a little hard to see, I'm kind of in the way, you can see that you can um, program your uh, sprites um, right in here as well as backdrops over here on the far right. Uh, sprites are those PNG files, portable graphic files, where you can have like a cookie cutter cutout, like an object. A backdrop is like a JPEG, which is like a, a big giant picture. All right, so let's dive into this first. Uh, there is a tutorial that pops up right off the bat. You can check that out. Um, you can play through those if you'd like. I'm going to close that out for today. If you do want to get back into the tutorials, you'll find them back here at the very top. So when you click on tutorials up here, You'll see you can have stuff on getting started, um, stuff that you can imagine, uh, making basic uh, stories, uh, having things talk. There's all these skills, making music, um, there's coloring in here. Um, the one I'm going to show you today is a variation on this Pong game. The Pong game, um, I'm actually not going to take you through the tutorial. You can go through their tutorial. I'm going to take you through my own tutorial today because I'm going to expand a bit on that. 
Um, so very first thing is we want to uh, create a Pong game that has a ball. Um, so I'm going to come down here to our sprites and uh, where it says choose a sprite, little cat face there. I'm going to come up here. There's upload a sprite. So you can just pick an, uh, an image from your computer if you wanted to. So you can download images from the internet and upload them in here. Uh, you could pick a surprise. Uh, you can paint your own. It has its own digital art program in here. Or you can choose a sprite. I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. This is the fast and easy way to do things. So here's a good ball. We've got a basketball. We've got a baseball. Um, there's a button here that looks like a ball. I like this one. It's just called ball. And you'll see as I hover over it, it's changing color. That's telling me that it has different costumes associated with that ball. So I'm going to click on that one. And now you'll see I have a ball up here. I can click and drag. And I also have the cat. Well, I don't need the cat. So I'm going to hit this little trash can here. Um, and now we have the ball um, just by itself, just an empty ball in space. Over here is a whole bunch of dots, motion, looks, sound, events, control. Um, we have sensing, operators, variables, and my blocks. We're going to touch on most of these today at one point or another. The very first one we'll use is the very first block under motion called move 10 steps. We're just going to throw that in. You'll see I have the ball selected over here. So this means anything I put into this workspace is going to affect the ball over here. If I click on this little block here, you'll see the ball move in space. So that gives me a preview of what that little piece of coding does. All right, so we can move that ball in space. But what if we wanted it to move perpetually, like constantly be bouncing around? Well, we could come over here to Control. And we could say forever move 10 steps. We'll put that on. Now this green flag up here is important. This starts your program versus the stop sign here stops your program. So if I hit the green go sign, oh, nothing's happening. You know why? Because even though we told it to always forever move 10 steps, what we need is an event that initiates this. So I'm going to come back over to our yellow events here. And I'm going to use this when green flag clicked. I'm going to click and drag that over. Um, you can also um, uh, rearrange these once they are moved around here. You can pull them apart. Um, you can also right click on stuff and duplicate. Whatever you right click on, you can duplicate. So if I right click on just move 10 steps, I can do that. If you want to throw stuff away, you can just click and drag it back into your bin over here if you don't need it. All right, now that we've had that when green flag clicked forever, move 10 steps. Let's try it now. Ah, OK, but then it hit a wall and it stopped. OK, I bring that ball back over, but it really, truly forever where it wants to move until I hit the stop. So I'm going to bring that ball back over. Well, that's pretty cool. So um, what happens if we change the 10 steps to, uh, let's say, 5? What happens then? The best part about coding is playing with things and seeing what things do what, what makes things tick. And in this case, you can see the ball is now moving slower. Um, we went to um, 5 steps from 10. So I'll bring it back up to 10. I just double clicked on that number and then I can um, retype in what I want. Let me bring my ball back over. Oh, come here, ball. Come back on over. There we go. I had to hit, hit the stop sign to keep it from moving forever. Now, when it hits the wall, we want it to do something else. If we go to over to our motion, at the very bottom, it says, if on edge, bounce. And I'm going to drag this over and you'll see I can snap it inside of my forever block. So forever, I want this ball to move at the rate of 10 steps. And if it's on the edge, bounce. Now I can hit that green flag, and there the ball goes. Now you see when it bounces, the ball turns upside down. So it's changing the angle of the ball. All right. We'll stop that right there. Now, it's kind of boring if the ball is just bouncing back and forth constantly. So instead, let's make the ball's angle change. So what we're going to do is come in here and if on edge, bounce, and turn 15 degrees. Let's see what happens. Oh, dear. You see that? That doesn't work. What if I bring this up here? Ah, now look what happens. You see, if I told it to always forever turn 15 degrees, it just spins in circles. But if I tell it to go ahead and turn 15 degrees but not forever, then every time it's on the edge of something and bounces, it's going to turn 15 degrees. OK, so that's one thing we can do there. Let's go ahead and add another sprite. So instead of just the ball, I'm going to come down here to our Choose the Sprites. I'll click on that. And 
Uh, let's see, let's select something for a paddle. What would be something that would be good for a paddle? Like maybe a big line of some sort. Let's see what we have in here. Um, there's a line, there's a magic wand. Those are pretty good. Ah, here we go, here's a paddle. I'm gonna click on the paddle. Here's my little green paddle. Now, I can move this around in space, but it has no coating attached with it, and nothing happens when the ball touches it. So if I move this paddle around, you see the ball just passes right through it. Because we haven't told the ball to interact with our paddle yet. Okay, so in order to do that, you see I can select the ball now, and I have the coating for the ball, or I have the paddle, and I can add coating for the paddle. Um, for the ball, though, we can make them interact either way. We can tell the ball to interact with the paddle, or we can tell the paddle to interact with the ball. It's kind of up to you. So in this case, I'm going to tell the ball to play with the paddle. So I'm going to come over here to our um, sensing, this light blue one, and I got one here that says touching. I'm going to drag this touching one in. It says right now touching mouse pointer, but if I click on that, I can change it to where it's touching the edge or the paddle. So the edge of our box is also something that can interact with, or it could interact with the mouse. But in this case, I want the ball to interact with the paddle. So I click on the paddle. And then from here, we could say, if it's touching the paddle, then, so I come up here to my controls, and I have this if then statement. This means if something happens, then we want something else to happen. Well, if the ball is touching the paddle, then we could have that ball bounce off the paddle. We could have it change direction. So let's come back up here to our motion. And we could have this turn or change um, whenever they interact with each other. So let's try this. If touching the paddle, rotate, let's say, 180 degrees. It goes the exact opposite way. Now remember, I don't have this hooked into my green flag. So I could take this and add it in. Let's see what happens now. Hmm, nothing's happening. Let's see what we can do about that. So we can go in here. What if we put the if then statement inside our forever loop? What would happen then? If the ball touches it, oh, there it goes. Now it's bouncing off. Oh, and we even got it stuck. Okay, let's see. There we go. Good. Now we need a way to move our paddle. So if we want to make our paddle move now um, to be able to hit the ball, we need to tell the paddle what to do. So you see we can select on the ball or we can select on the paddle. Um, we can have either one. If I select the ball, I have this coating up here. But if I select the paddle, I have an empty slate. Well, I'm going to fill this up now with a few things. We want this paddle to move any time that the green flag is clicked, right? So we will go ahead and click that events. We'll move that over. When the green flag is clicked, we want something to happen. And we want it to always happen. This, we want it to always be true that that, that paddle is going to move if we do something um, forever. And if I come over here to our motion, I can set the range of motion, let's say if I wanted to have that paddle follow my mouse, when I move my mouse to the left or right, I can have that paddle uh, follow the mouse. So I can go set X, and it brought up a number negative 48. That happens to be where the, the paddle already was. So if I change that number, now um, it changes the uh, set X to. So when I hit the green flag, you'll see it sets the X right there. And the problem though is, it's not following the mouse yet, is it? It's just set to be right there. Well, in order to get it to follow the mouse, we need to change it to sensing. We could have it follow anywhere that the mouse goes. So now I can have that, that paddle, no matter where I move the mouse, the paddle is going to follow the, the mouse on that X axis. You see that? And I can kind of pinch that ball. I can kind of get it stuck in there. OK, so we're doing pretty good so far. Let's add in a backdrop now. Um, over here, we have in the very bottom right, choose a backdrop. 
And again, you can upload one or you can um, get a surprise or you could paint one yourself. But I'm gonna, just gonna go ahead and choose one. Um, I like this neon tunnel one is one that they use in the tutorials. Um, I really like, um, let's see, oh, I like this galaxy one. I'm gonna use that galaxy one as the background. Okay, there's my background for the game now. And let's do something else. Let's change the ball. Um, how about any time the ball touches the paddle? You remember how I said it has a few different colors? If we go from the coating to the costumes up here in the upper left, you'll see the ball has a few different colors. And as I click on them, it changes the color of the ball. Well, these are called costumes, and they're different ways that the ball can look. If I come over here to our coating for the ball, I can tell the ball that any time it touches the paddle, I want it to change its costume. So the way I can do that, I can go, if touching paddle, then turn the ball, but then check this out. If I go up here to looks, the purple one here, I can go next costume, if touching the paddle, turn it that amount of uh, 180 degrees and change it to the next costume. Let's see what happens now when we test this out. Anytime you make a change, I recommend testing it out. You see that? The ball changes color now anytime it touches the paddle. Okay, um, we can do the same thing with sounds. Anytime it's touching the paddle, what if we wanted it to make a little bit of a sound? Okay, so we could go here to our pink um, circle here. We'll go to sound. Um, we could go uh, play sound until done, start sound. There's all these different options here. So I'm just gonna go with start sound because if we play sound pop until done, it, it'll make it uh, play the whole sound before the ball can do anything else and it'll freeze the ball. So instead I'll just start a sound. So I'll come here, let's see, we'll find out what this pop sound is. There we go, and we get a little pop every time it touches. Now there's some really fun stuff you can do with sounds. You can record your own on your Chromebooks and things like that. And I should mention I am using a Mac today, but that's just so I can have higher resolution as I'm showing you this. Um, anything I'm doing today you can do on a Chromebook or a PC. All right, let's go in there and um, add in, what if, could we just play some music? Um, would that work as well? So when the green flag is clicked, we could play some music. So, um, we don't have any music in here right now, but we could record some music. And we could record ourselves singing, for example. Um, uh, or you could um, bring in a song, you could scratch in a song from someone else's project as well as another option that you could do. So just know that you can add music in that way as well. I'll pull that back out because I don't need it right now. Okay, let's get into something a little more complicated now. Um, we don't have a score or any way of keeping track of our progress in the game. So we could come up here um, and go to variables. You see the orange circle? We go to variables. A variable can be, uh, it's a number that can be anything. Um, it, it's an imaginary number. Um, so if our score, let's say we wanted our score to be zero, we could take um, your variable, we have one here, my variable, we could set my variable to zero when the green flag is clicked. But you know what, I'm gonna code this inside the ball instead of inside the paddle. So I'm gonna come over here to the ball. I'm gonna go uh, set my variable to zero. So at the very beginning of the game, the score is always reset to zero. And then I can, sh let's see, uh, show my variable so I can have an idea of what my score is. So when I click the green flag, I have my variable up there. Well, that's not a very good name for a score. So I can change the name of that um, let's see, I can right click where it says my variable up here. And I can go rename variable and I'll rename this one score. All right, so in our score now, it shows up as score up here. We want our score to go up anytime, hmm, let's see, we could have our score go up anytime the ball touches the paddle. So we could change the score by one, but where do we put this? Well, forever, if the the paddle is touching um, uh, the ball, that would be a pretty good place to put it. So we could put that in here. And let's see what happens now. Let's test it out. We have the ball coming down. Oh, our score went to one now. Now there you go. That's one way that we can do this. Um, let's say we wanted to make the game harder as we go along. What if um, the ball increases speed 
as um, we have a higher score. So we could come in here. And you remember when we set the speed of our ball to 10 steps? What if we slowed that down now to, let's say, 5? Okay, now the ball moves very slow. But what if we wanted it to speed up every time we hit it? I have an idea. What if we changed our speed to a variable? Let's make this variable speed. And we could set um, our speed when the green flag is clicked to five. So that way our speed is always five. Now we'll take our speed variable and we'll put it inside of this move five steps. Now it'll say move speed steps. So move whatever speed equals steps. In this case, we want it to equal five when we start. Now, what if we have the speed increase? So we have changed score by one, but what if we also changed speed by one? Well, this is gonna get pretty crazy pretty fast. So I'll hit the green flag, show it. Oh, score went to one, speed went to six. Scores two, speed seven, eight. Uh-oh, things are gonna get faster and faster and faster now. I wonder how long before um, I lose here. Now, something I'm noticing right now is that the ball's basically moving into the exact same pattern. So it's very predictable. So even if I got going really fast, I could still win this game. Well, I don't know if I could win it. Eventually it's gonna go too fast for me. But you see, it's very predictable. I need to add some variation to the game. Okay, whoa, okay, our speed's getting a little crazy now, isn't it? You see the ball, it's really, really zipping now. Whoa, okay. So we need to add some variation to that ball's movement. So if we go in here, where did we have it turn? Oh, that's right, it turns 15 degrees at the very beginning. Um, something we could do at the very beginning is this. We could have the ball uh, point towards a specific direction. Um, so let's go into uh, motion. Let's point in direction 45. So instead of pointing straight to the right, we'll have it point kind of up and to the right. That way, that's where the ball always starts. So when you hit the green flag, you'll see the ball now moves to the upper right. Well, that gives us a little bit of variation. But every time we hit the ball, it's changing it by 180 degrees. Well, we have some really cool operations. 180 degrees means it's, the ball is always going to move in the opposite direction that it hit on the paddle. Instead, let's see if we can have this turn into a range of options. So let's see. Um, let's see if we have anything like that in here. Um, we could have, hmm. Let's see, where, where could we find something like that? Maybe in our operations here, I think. Oh, check this one out, pick random. I'm gonna take this pick random and I'm gonna put it in there instead of 180 degrees. And I'm gonna tell it to, let's add 30 degrees either way to the left or the right that it could go. So we'll take, what's a 30 less than 180? Well, that's 150. What's 30 more than 180? Well, that's 210. So let's try this again now. As that ball is coming down, it should hit the paddle. Oh, look at that. It kind of went off at a weird angle there, didn't it? So I think it's working now. So that ball is going to have more variation on how it hits. There we go. Now, there's something still our game is really missing. What happens if the ball touches the bottom? Let's say if the ball touches the bottom, we lose the game. Well, how do we do that? Um, let's figure out a few different options. There's actually lots of different ways we can make us lose. Um, because the choice is yours. Let's come in and add another sprite. Let's do it this way. I'm going to click choose a sprite. I'm going to come down and I'm going to pick, um, let's see, a line. Now we have this big red line. I'm going to move this to the bottom right here. And this line, it's called line over here in its sprite. If the ball touches that line, we want to lose, right? So if the ball is touching the paddle, it does a whole bunch of things. But what if the ball instead touches that line? We'll go into sensing here and we'll go touching. If 
the ball is touching the line, then under control, we have stop all. And we can make the game just stop. Let's see if that works. I'm gonna let it go. There we go. We are at stop and the game ends. Now I have to hit the green flag in order to start it again. Oh, but look at that. The ball started down here at the stop sign. Let's see, I'm gonna get it to go there. Oh, the ball starts there. But now when I hit the green flag, watch what happens to the ball. It's still stuck. So we have a glitch. We need to fix our glitch. So let's put the ball where we want it. And if we go over to motion, you'll see it has this go to. And as I change where the ball is, if I click and drag it, it changes where the go to X and go to Y are. So I can pick a starting location for the ball. Let's start it up here. And I'll click and drag this. When green flag is clicked, we'll set all of our variables and then we'll also go to that particular location. So this way, when we lose that ball, when I hit the green flag, starts again at the top. Now remember how that ball is kind of predictable about where it's gonna go at first. So I had originally set it to point in direction 45. Well, what if we use that pick random again for that? We'll come down here, pick random, and I'm gonna drop this in to point and direction, and we'll add some variation to that. So we'll go from, let's say, oh, I don't know, 10 degrees to 80 degrees. Let's see where it starts now. You see, it's starting to choose a few different options. Um, we could get even a little crazier with that. We could go all the way from 10 degrees, let's say, let's go all the way up to like 170 degrees. Um, let's see what that does. Ooh, so now it could point down. What if it went all the way from zero degrees all the way up to 360, which is a full circle? We'll go 360. And now as we start it, I'm clicking the green flag. That ball could be going in any direction whatsoever. Hey, up here we have score and speed. What if I wanted to hide the speed variable? I could come over here and I just click that little box next to speed and that variable goes away. All right. So we have a pretty functional game now. We have a way to play, a way to make it harder, which improves it replayability, and we have a way to lose. So I hope you can have a lot of fun with Scratch. This is a great game. Again, for anybody who's third grade through 12th grade, there's all kinds of things you can do with Scratch. And today, we just scratched the surface. So I hope you enjoy getting to play around with this. Scratch.mit.edu. Learn how to program something. Program a story. Program a game. Make music for it. Make art for it. There's so many things that you could do to put into a game. Have the game tell a story, make a pause screen. You could have the game have an in-game store with upgrades. You could make it multiplayer. There's so many options with what you can do with these games. You can go check out the Scratch website, see what other people have done as well. And for everyone here at Medford Anywhere Learning TV, I hope you have a great day. Thanks for tuning in to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Medford School District is a place where all are learning and learning is for all.